She lectures nationally and internationally about terrorism and current affairs. She is the founder, the president, and CEO of ACT for America, the largest national security grassroots organization in America with 300,000 members and 900 chapters, chapters nationwide dedicated to preserving national security and promoting Western values. She's the author of two New York Times bestsellers, Because They Hate, A Survivor of Islamic Terror Warns America, and her second book, They Must Be Stopped, Why We Must Defeat Radical Islam and How We Can Do It. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Braji Gabriel. all the time, you know, I'll come here every day. <laughs> what an exciting time to be in Washington, D.C. Isn't it amazing? You know, never a dull moment in this city. Um, you know, I read articles before I came here that said about the uh, Values Voters Summit that Brigitte Gabrielle, the Islamophobe, will be speaking. Well, I'm here to tell the press, I won't disappoint you. <laughs> As you very well know, I am not politically correct, so you need to check your sensitivity sleeves out the door. Brigitte Gabrielle has just entered the room. So the big brouhaha in the country for the last week has been Ben Carson and Donald Trump talking about the threat of radical Islam to our national security. And everybody is in a hoof, bent out of shape, upset. Everybody's trying to walk on eggshell. And everybody is trying to understand why these two great men are concerned about protecting the United States of America. So for those of you who do not understand what, why these two men are concerned about it, let me share with you a little bit of the ideology they are concerned about, because that impacts us directly. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to crunch 1,400 years of Islamic history in five minutes and make it as exciting as I can possibly make it, because I hated history when I was a little girl. At this age, I appreciate history. And now I understand why they say, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. In order for you to understand why Western civilization is very different than the Islamic world, you need to understand the history of Islam. When Prophet Muhammad supposedly revealed his revelation from the angel Gabriel that he is supposed to be the last of the prophets in the early 600s, he started preaching in his own city, Mecca. He tried to recruit friends and followers to be able to uh, spread his religion. And he tried for 12 years and failed. And after 12 years, he was only able to recruit his immediate family and friends. So he decided, if I go to Medina, which was the Jewish hub of Arabia, the business hub where the Jews lived, if I go there and preach my religion to them, if they accept me, that will buy me respect and stature between my own people and they will accept me. So Prophet Muhammad started borrowing a lot from the Old Testament to make his religion more palpable to the Jews, to make it a lot similar. This is why you see a lot of similarities between Judaism and Islam. For example, Jews don't eat pigs, Muslims don't eat pigs. Jews pray a few times a day, Muslims pray a few times a day. Jews fast on Yom Kippur, Muslims fast on Ramadan. And this is why you started seeing a lot of good writing in the beginning of the Quran when Prophet Muhammad was saying all the good things about the people of the book. He took his message and went to Medina trying to recruit the Jews talking about the people of the book, talking about how similar the two religions are. 
When they refused to accept him and follow him as the last of the prophet, that's when he turned against them and started killing them and started expelling them. That's when Islam went from a spiritual movement for the first 12 years of Islam into a political movement cloaked in religion after the year of the Hijra, after Muhammad went to Medina and the Jews did not accept him. He became a military warrior and declared war on them and started expelling them. Jews and Christians became dimmi or second class citizens. They were only allowed to stay alive and not be killed only by paying the jizya or the protection tax. So they had a choice, convert to Islam or if you want to stay alive, you have to pay the jizya or protection tax living as dimmi in the Islamic uh, nation. Christians and Jews could not ring a church bell. Jews could not blow the shofar. Christians could not ring church bells. They could not pray publicly. Uh, uh, Christians and Jews could not gather together and build new churches or new temples. And the way they paid the jizya or the protection tax was in a monthly ceremony where they would get together downtown and the Jew would kneel on his knee and hand his goods to the mullah who would take the goods as the, as, as, as the price for buying the protection. And in many areas, Jews and Christians were given necklaces to wear as a receipt that they paid their jizya or their protection tax. Jews considered najis under Islam. Najis is bodily fluid. Najis is, uh, is garbage. Najis is dogs. Najis is dirty. So Christians and Jews were treated as second-class citizens. Islam continued to grow. As Islam grew, more people became dimmi or second-class citizens. Jews and Christians were given identifiable clothing. The yellow star, which was given to the Jews that most people think is a German invention. It was actually an Islamic invention in the 9th century in Iraq by the second Khalif, Khalif al-Mutawakkil of Iraq, who invented the yellow star for the Jews to be identified as they walked down the street. Because Jews were considered najis, if a Muslim man or a Jew walked on the same side of the street, the Jew had to cross the other side so the Muslim man can walk so he's not dirtied by the filth of the Jew. Christians were given the zunar, the belt, which most of you men are wearing right now. That was an Islamic invention for the Christians. Islam continued to grow. They went all the way to Jerusalem. They conquered Jerusalem. Christians couldn't ring their church bells in Jerusalem. The Pope in Rome in 1090 told the Christians, how could you sit idly by and allow your brethren to, be, uh, suffer, to suffer like this in the Holy Land? You need to go liberate the Christians. You need to go help the Christians. That's why the Crusaders were launched. The Crusaders... <laughs> The Crusaders were not launched because they just felt like waking up in the morning and going and converting a bunch of Muslims or beheading them. The Crusaders were launched to liberate Jerusalem. And they were able to liberate Jerusalem for less than 100 years before Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, Saladin, took it back and Jerusalem remained under Islamic control until 1967 when the state of Israel liberated Jerusalem where Christians, Jews, and Muslims could pray under the same sky. The Crusaders continued fighting Islam, and for 300 years they tried and failed. And by the 1300s, the Crusaders disappeared because they could not win against Islam. Islam continued to expand. They went all the way to Central Europe. They went all the way to China. They went to India. They conquered Spain. They changed the name of Spain from Spain to Andalusia. And they started, as, as they advanced, as they conquered more nations, more people paid the jizya or the protection tax. And this is how the Islamic empire grew. It went all the way until they were stopped at the gates of Vienna on 9-11. I mean, 9-11 is not a date that Osama bin Laden just picked out of a hat. 9-11 is a symbolic date in the Islamic calendar. Between the 1600, by the 1600s, Islam had covered more of the earth's surface than the Roman Empire did at its peak. 
between the 1600s and the 1800s, the Europeans were experiencing the European Industrial Revolution, where the Europeans were able to invent products on factory lines, where they are able to make money and sell products, which gave them the money to build a strong army in order to fight the Muslims. And that's how they were able to stop them at the gates of Vienna on 9-11. The, the Europeans started the pushback against Islam. They pushed them out of Europe. They pushed them out of to, uh, all the way to the Middle East and North Africa. By 1924, the Islamic empire ended in 1924. The Islamic caliphate ended in Turkey by President Ataturk, who was a secularist. He ended the Islamic empire and he gave women rights to vote. He gave women a right to an education, a right to work, a right to choose a husband. He forbid women from wearing the hijab. He forbid men from wearing the beard. The Muslim hate him so much that they consider him a Jewish agent because they believe that his mother in her blood line was Jewish and that was the influence on Ataturk. By the time the Islamic Empire or the Islamic Caliphate or the Islamic State ended in 1924, the Islamic Caliphate had existed for 1400 years and it ended less than 100 years ago. By the time the Islamic Caliphate ended in 1924, 270 million people around the world were killed by Islam. 270 million. And we didn't have weapons of mass destruction and there was nuclear weapons. All of these people were killed, butchered by the sword. The people in the world, less than 100 years ago, how many people knew this history? Please raise your hand. We in America have failed to educate our children about history. We in America failed to educate our population about history. Our children in high school, you take any 17, 16 year old kid, 18 year old kid and ask them about World War II. They can't even tell you what happened in World War II. For them, it's ancient history and we still have our World War II veteran walking among us. That's how little we know of history. Islam ended in 1924, the caliphate. People thought Islam, will, the caliphate will never be resurrected. The caliphate will never come back. But two things happened in the Middle East in the last century that made the Islamists be able to resurrect the caliphate. Number one is the discovery of oil in Saudi Arabia, which we were able to discover and were stupid enough to allow them to nationalize it. And the number two that happened was Ayatollah Khomeini coming to power in 1979. That gave the Islamists the money and also the spiritual covering in order to explode on the world stage. And people say, oh, well, the Wahhabis exported their Wahhabi radical religion. The Wahhabis are the name of Wahhab. They're not a different sect of Islam. They follow the authentic preaching of Prophet Muhammad the way Prophet Muhammad lived and practiced his religion. This is why neither you or me or any infidel can step a foot in Mecca because as far as they're concerned, we are filth. And as infidels, we're not allowed to step a foot, not President Obama and not anybody else. As a matter of fact, Al-Qaeda used to use uh, Saudi Arabia and its success as, a, as an excuse to recruit members, as the example, to show them how Allah has blessed Saudi Arabia because of the way they adhere to the tenets of Islam. And today we talk about ISIS. ISIS is not a new invention. ISIS resurrected the caliphate that ended less than 100 years ago. Except we are too ignorant and too uninformed to understand why, what ISIS is doing and why ISIS is succeeding. Two things you need to understand uh, about Islam and the principles of war in Islam. One is the law of taqiyah, which means lying and deception. It means that a Muslim man can lay his hand on the Quran and swear that he is telling the truth, knowing that he is lying, but also knowing that the Quran will forgive him because he is advancing the cause of Islam. The second thing you need to know about is that the Treaty of al hudaybiyah which is an Islamic principle of war and a model on how to deceive your enemy when you have to sign 
peace treaties with your enemy. And it is based on an example by Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad was attacking the Meccans and their caravans when he was living in Medina. One day he attacked them because this is how he got the goodies. He would attack them, rob them, and spread the goodies among his men. And this is how he was able to recruit because this is how people made money without working. And so he attacked the Meccan caravans. When he realized he's not able to defeat the Meccans in that city of Al Hudaybiyah, in that place, he signed a 10 year treaty with them. Does that sound familiar? Yes. A 10 year treaty with them that says he will not attack them, he will have peace with them, he will not declare war on them. Muhammad used the treaty for two years to build his military, strengthen his army, and when he realized he was strong enough to attack his enemies when they least expected it because they, th they thought they had a peace treaty with Muhammad, he broke the treaty, attacked them two years later, and Mecca fell within 24 hours because they were not expecting the attack. And that became a principle of war in Islam. And to give you an example of how that is practiced, this is why Anything signed with Iran means nothing to them. And to give you an example of how this law has been put to use in the last in recent history, Yasser Arafat, who's not an Islamist, but he is a Muslim, met with the Israelis and signed the Oslo Accord in 1993. Remember all the handshaking at the lawn of the White House? The Oslo Accord, Yasser Arafat used the peace treaty, the Oslo Accord with Israel, to get Israel to bring him back and give him his territory, finance his military, train his police, and give his police the weapons. Yasser Arafat broke the Oslo Accord eight years later, didn't even wait 10 years, and declared the second intifada in 2000, and all hell broke loose. He used the same treaty to win and deceive against his enemies, and deceive his enemies. When Jordanian press, after Yasser Arafat signed the Oslo Accord with Israel, and Egyptian press would interview Yasser Arafat, and they would say, how could you sign a peace treaty with the devil? How could you sign a peace treaty with the Jews? Yasser Arafat will tell them, remember Hudaybiyah. That's all he would have to say. The whole Muslim world knew exactly what Yasser Arafat was talking about. We in the West and the Jews in Israel, it was over their heads. Nobody understood what Hudaybiyah was referring to. And this is the type of deception that we are dealing with. So when Iran signs a peace treaty with the United States for 10 years, they are using us as useful idiots, as gullible, ignorant people who are signing a peace treaty with the devil in order for Iran to continue her thing. That is why it is so important to be wise about who we're going to put in the White House next year. This is why it is very important that whoever we're going to elect next year to office, that the next president be well informed about the history of radical Islam, understand our enemy, understand what ISIS is all about, understand what it's their end goal is. And this is exactly, people are wondering how come ISIS is having such success recruiting people from all over the world. They exploded all over the world. Pew, the Pew Research uh, did a poll. And of course, the Pew Research is not Brigitte Gabriel, is not Fox News, is not Tony Perkins. The Pew Research did a poll in 2013 when they went around the world and interviewed Muslims from Islamic countries all over the world. And they asked them two questions. Would you like to have Sharia law as the law of your country? And would you like to see the Islamic Caliphate? And remember, this was in 2013 before ISIS. The five top countries in the world, in the Islamic world, the five top Islamic countries, Indonesia, 240 million, 204 million Muslims. Indonesia, Afghanistan, uh, Indonesia, Pakistan, Egypt, Nigeria, and Bangladesh. 77% of Muslims interviewed in these Islamic countries, 77% want the establishment of Sharia law and want the establishment of an Islamic state. That means 77% of the world, quote, moderate Muslims agree with the establishment of ISIS and what ISIS is doing. 
Let's not fool ourselves. This is very important that whoever we're going to elect is going to be somebody who is strong on national security, who's going to put America first, who's going to make America great again, who's going to send a strong message to the world. The minute he walks into office, whoever we elect, that the world is going to realize that this person you're not going to mess with because he could care less about what you think, what the UN thinks, what the world thinks. They can all go to hell. We care about America and only the United States of America. This is why this issue is important, and that is the Pew Research. This is why we need to take care of our country. This is why we at ACT for America are working very hard. We are the largest national security organization in the country. We need you to join us, actforamerica.org. We are working very hard to stop the resettlement of new Syrian refugees coming from the Middle East into the country. We cannot afford it. We cannot afford to bring into this country people we do not know anything about. We cannot vet them. They are lying. They are coming without passports. And we know ISIS is infiltrating them. We are now working on two bills in Congress, one by Babin, and one by McCall, to stop the influx of bringing more refugees into the country. We have refugee resettlement working groups. Make sure you stop by our booth, Act for America, in the booth hall, in the exhibit hall, and join us. Make sure you go to our website, actforamerica.org and get involved. We cannot afford to lose our country. This, is ele this election is not about economy, it's not about health care. It is about survival. It is about our survival and the survival of Western civilization. And I, and I'm going to end my speech with a very important quote. You know, they say it's important to listen to those who are coming to warn us about what's to come, especially those who survived to tell about it. I'm a survivor of Islamic terror. I lost my country of birth, Lebanon, to radical Islam. I do not want to lose my adopted country, America. And for those of you who do not my story, I encourage you to read my book, Because They Hate. You'll understand why I'm so passionate about this issue and about why I'm warning with such passion, warning America about why we need to protect America. And I'm going to end with this quote from Ailey Wiesel's book. Ailey Wiesel is the Holocaust survivor, Nobel Prize winner. And this is out of his book. He said, the fate of the Jews of the small town in Transylvania called Saige, their blindness as they confronted the destiny from which they would have still had time to flee, the inconceivable passivity with which they surrendered to it, Deaf to the warnings and pleas of a witness who, having escaped the massacres, relates to them what he has seen with his own eyes, but they refuse to believe him and call him a madman. I hope that we learn from the lessons of history, that we learn from the Ailey Wiesels, from the Brigitte Gabriels, and many others who are warning America about what's to come. May God walk with you as you leave this hotel and you leave this conference, and may God walk, guide your path as you walk your neighborhoods, as you study about the issue, as you become active, as you become an instrument of change in our country, because our country's survival depends on the next election. May God bless you and all, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you.